Hare Krishna. I am so grateful to have these two very dear, exalted God brothers with us today. I am remembering some years ago I was in Germany giving some lectures, meeting people, leading kirtans. I was told that His Holiness Kavi Chandra Swami Maharaj was in a hospital in critical condition and that he had been unconscious for several days. While he was in Africa doing his seva, because he has taken serious responsibilities in Africa, especially since His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Swami Maharaj was taken by Prabhupada and Krishna from this world. Um, he has tried with all his heart to serve the mission and the devotees there. And I believe it's mostly Western Africa. Um, Ghana, Nigeria, Ivory Coast, Liberia. Not there? Okay. Well, those places. But for a Western person, it's very difficult. And he Somehow or other, he was struck with a deadly form of malaria, the type of malaria that goes to your brain. And many, many people die of that malaria. So he was in critical condition. And nobody knew if he would live or die. So I went to the hospital to see him just so happened. By Krishna's grace, I didn't even know he was sick because I don't do internet so much. I was just doing whatever I do and they told me he was sick so I was very disturbed. He got this malaria from Africa and I was praying for him and I said, where is he? They said, He's in a hospital just a couple miles away. And with great sincerity, he expressed to me how we, we have to, um, what were the words he said? He said, it's so important that we work together to give Prabhupada's books to the people of Africa. My memory was that Radhana Swami pulled me out from the coma. <laughs> because a few times I had kind of come up and the devotees were around and they all looked in so much anxiety. And, but he didn't. I looked at him and he looked completely transcendental. <laughs> That's what I remember. My memory was really mixed up. I thought Pritu was there at the same time, but he was there the day before or something. <laughs> it was like hard to get it straight. They told me it was the first time you came to consciousness. The first time I said anything, that's for sure. I might have just opened my eyes for a few seconds. But in reality, the words he spoke actually took me out of my coma. <laughs> Thank you.
<laughs> you see, when you say something like that, just after you know being in this near-death situation, unconscious in a coma, it's not that you can plan it or rehearse it. That I will say something, you know, it just from his heart. That's his consciousness, his first words. You know, for some people, they would say, I'm not going back to Africa again. <laughs> His first thought, not only his first words, his first thought after being in a coma for so many days was, we should go back to Africa to give Prabhupada's books to his people. This is the type of spirit of compassion that Srila Prabhupada installed within the hearts of his loving followers. And Kavi Chandra Maharaj is such a person. We're so grateful that you are here. Let us express our deep appreciation by loudly chanting Hari Bol. <laughs>
Sakti Vinod Thakur in one beautiful song, Shuddha Bhakat Achara Narenu, he describes how when he comes home, to his home, to be with his family, he sees that his home is transformed and non-different than Goloka Vrindavan. And Srila Prabhupada explained, when a husband and wife are united with Krishna in the center of their relationship, then the home is non-different than Vaikuntha. It's not only non-different than Vaikuntha. Prabhupada said it is Vaikuntha, the spiritual world. Vaikuntha means a place of no anxiety. I can't imagine a family without anxiety. And I'm sure if we speak to Shesha Prabhu or his wife or children, they will tell you there's so many anxieties. Yes. But it's a different kind of anxiety. Vaikuntha means no material, selfish anxieties. The anxiety of the challenges that come in the service to Krishna are actually transcendental. You see, between any relationships, between, for any of us, whether we're living in the Brahmacharya ashram or whether we're sannyasis sitting in the GBC meeting or whether we're grihastas, there's going to be natural clashes between individuals, challenges in relationship. When we are sincere to resolve that in such a way that's Krishna conscious, what does Krishna want? Even if there's troubles, even if there's anxiety, if there's crises, if the way we deal with that crisis is, what does Krishna want? What does Srila Prabhupada want? And somehow or other we agree to resolve situations with that formula, then that anxiety is vaikuntha. <laughs> it's, that anxiety is actually removing us from material anxiety because it's an anxiety to serve Krishna. As far as family life, in Srimad Bhagavatam, Shukadev Goswami, who's the crest jewel of sannyasis, Goswami, he writes that Yashoda Mai and Rohini Devi Mai, the mother of Krishna and Shibalaramji, that they were constantly in the anxiety of trying to protect Krishna and Balaram. It's not that, you know, they would wake up in the morning. Om Shanti. <laughs> they were beyond that. The Christian Balaram were so naughty. <laughs> they were the best children you could possibly have. <laughs> the supreme children. Because they were so expert at increasing their parents' love by putting them in anxiety. And they, Sukadeva Goswami said they were afraid that they might get hit by the horn of a bull or stepped on by the hoof of a cow or bit by dogs or um, scratched by monkeys or bit by mosquitoes. Yes. Whatever it may be. You know, they were always in anxiety. And little Lord Chaitanya, he was Nimai Pandit. Oh, what he did. His loving parents, Nanda and Yashoda, came in the form of Jagannath Mishra and Sachi Devi. And Nimai, he's just a little baby, has hardly walking, and he crawls over to a giant serpent and grabs him. The serpent's trying to get away, and he grabs him. And then the serpent curls up 
and Nimai lays on the coils of a giant venomous snake. Now, mother and fathers, you have a little baby still crawling around. You go in your front lawn. I don't know if you have lawns so much in Mumbai. <laughs> <laughs> you go to the front of your house and you see a giant venomous black colored snake in a coil. Its tongue is going And you see your baby laying in the coil, smiling. <laughs> what do you do? Om Shanti. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the nature of a mother's love. They were in total, Sachi, Devi, Jagannath, Misha, all the relatives were in total anxiety. But that anxiety is Vaikuntha. <laughs> Because it's about Krishna. It's not about, you know, their frustrated own expectations and desires, which is the anxiety of this world. It's about protecting Krishna, loving Krishna. And Krishna appears, as Shesha Prabhu has explained, in the form of a deity, especially to put us in anxiety. And that anxiety is the supreme peace. Because, you know, we're, we have now Radharani, Krishna, Gopinath, they have personally, directly appeared. They're not representations of Krishna. Somebody once challenged Srila Prabhupada, if, if, if Krishna's unlimited, how could he be in this limited form? Prabhupada's response. If, no, they said, if Krishna's unlimited, why are you trying to limit him to this little limited form? And Prabhupada's response is, is if Krishna's unlimited, why are you trying to limit him by saying he can't be, li he can't be in this form? <laughs> it's a reality. Krishna is the creator of the whole material energy. Aham sarvasya prabhava matta sarvam prabhartate. So if Krishna wants, he could fully manifest in any, in any part of his energy. Shalagram Shila. It's a little, apparently a little stone in the bottom of the Gandaki River. Yes, Krishna... He's created the stone, it's his energy. He can manifest in that energy. It's like these light bulbs. There's an electrical current. The light bulb itself is just a material thing. But when electricity comes into it, it gives light. It is light. The sun planets, the energy of the sun planet is actually manifesting directly in this light. So similarly, an object, if Krishna decides by his own desire to manifest within a form, whatever that may be, that form is Krishna. And Krishna accepts the form to accept our service. And that means to protect, that means to feed, that means to dress, that means to bathe, that means to pray. And sometimes if you go into the little kitchen where our ladies of congregation do the bhoga offerings, or the big kitchen where the brahmacharis and others are doing very large offerings, sometimes there's anxieties there. Anxiety about the time, anxiety about so many you know, things not working properly, or anxiety about things burning. <laughs> yes. And you're trying the best you can to cook, you know, for a couple thousand people, two, three thousand people for the Sunday program, and ten minutes before the offering, it burns. <laughs> what do you do? I remember once there was a festival in America 
where all the leaders and and thousand devotees came. It was a big, big festival. And it was a codice. And one of my dear friends was the head cook. He was cooking everything in giant quality, quantities of thousands of people, giant quantity. And it was basically because it was a codice, they were they were making one really big preparation. So they didn't have the funds to make a lot of things. They were making one gigantic subji. And it took about six hours to make this subji. And now it's just minutes before the offering, then there's RT, then everyone's going to be eating, because it was a half day fast too. And everybody was really hungry. Do you like this story so far? <laughs> Gets better. So the head cook you know, says to somebody who's helping him, you know, I have to, I have to like get the Tulsi leaves and all of that, whatever. So could you stir this pot? So he's stirring the pot, and he's just looking at it, and he's seeing these massive subji. It's, it's the only preparation I think there was, a massive subji. Everybody's hungry waiting outside, and he's stirring it. So he just decided, you know, you know, you know I could do better than just stirring. There must be something else I can do. He was a Brahmin, too. He said, you know, this subji needs some more color. So he happened to go in the refrigerator and saw this massive bag of peas. And he poured all the peas in the subji. Then the head cook came back. He, all, he was on the verge of being like, Kavi Chandra Swami. <laughs> he practically went into a cult. No, wow. <laughs> Meanwhile, the person was gone by the time he saw it. You know, he just peas in the subji, and you know, somehow or other. You know, Ikadasi, you're not supposed to eat grains or beans. So I guess he thought grains or beans, but these are peas. <laughs> so he asked the person, why did you do this? He said, what, did I, what do you mean? So it has more color, it'll have more flavor. He says, Ikadasi, you ruined it. He said, no, no, it's not. He said, we're not, he said, Ikadasi is grains and beans. And Beans, these are peas. <laughs> there was no time to cook anything else. Everyone else was starving. No, we're talking about in America now. There was serious anxiety. And the head cook was responsible for everything. And there was no more subjis. They used everything they had. And they're in the middle of nowhere. So what are you supposed to do? He was in terrible anxiety. I remember he came up to me and told me, so what do you think I should do? I said, I'm just a junior person here. You should ask one of the leaders. <laughs> He said, but I'm afraid to ask the leaders. <laughs> the leaders have the power to crush me. I, I said, no, no, no. You know. He said, I don't know. So what he did was quite controversial. Would you like to hear? It was quite a historical event. Anyone who was there will never forget it. Because it was time for the prasad to be served. And your duty is, before you eat, you have to take every pea out of your subject. (laughs) 
I never saw anything like this. You know, everybody, they're coming with the ladle and they're putting, and all the servers were telling everybody, because it's already announced, but they were reminding, don't eat a single pea. <laughs> If you eat a single pea, you know, you're going to make a great operad. <laughs> and the, hot, the sabji was really hot, because it just came out of the pots, and they were like, and there was no spoons or forks in those days, so people with their hands, they're like going. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, they said, save the peas till tomorrow. <laughs> Because not only is it an offense to, to break a codicy, but it's an offense to waste prasad. <laughs> so they were like, they had a little peas in the pile, and it took about 15 minutes before anyone could start eating. Because <laughs> they were really afraid there might be a pea in there. So, anxiety. And all they're doing is trying to do devotional service. In this world, they, there are challenges. So in Grihasta life, anxieties will be there in every aspect of life. But when we put Krishna in the center, putting Krishna in the center means the deities are the proprietors of our house. And we're all the servants and the maid servants. And to the degree we respect and honor each other as Krishna's devotees. Not that you have to be what I want you to be. That's putting yourself in the center. Rather, I have to be what Krishna wants me to be. And that means I'm forgiving, I'm tolerant, I'm exemplary in my own sadhana, and I care about I care about all of you because you're Krishna's children under my care. That's what it means to put Krishna in the center of a house. And when we do that, the house is Vaikuntha. And Shesha Prabhu is one of, in, in my own observation, he's one of the greatest inspirations of, of this very divine principle. His good wife, Marumati Devi, and his two daughters. And every year I try to go to their home to, he has me give lectures. But actually, you know, even though his family doesn't speak so much lecture, when I'm there, I'm the one that's giving lecture. Their actions are such a wonderful lecture. St. Francis of Assisi, he had said that a devotee should always be preaching. And when necessary, should say something. <laughs> what does that mean? The greatest preaching is by example. When, when Sanatan Goswami was speaking about, I believe, Haridas Thakur, he said, some people speak nicely and some people act nicely, but it's very rare to find somebody who speaks nicely and also acts nicely. So these two great personalities, such an exemplary sannyasi in the renounced order, loudly chanting. <laughs> And we also have somewhere here, my dear, very dear God brother, Virabahu Prabhu, and his very exalted wife, Karta Mataji. Are either of them here? They're somewhere. But I think it's the first time they've ever come to Radha Gopinath Temple. They are both very deeply learned in our philosophy, 
extraordinarily exemplary as preachers, as um, just through their qualities, through their words, and have taken on tremendous responsibilities as a husband and wife. And we're so grateful they're here. I would speak so much more if I could see them. But if they hear somehow or other, let us welcome them by chanting. <laughs> And of course, our dear God sister, Nartaki Devi, who no need for me to say because you all know as good as me. We're so blessed that she's part of our family here. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna.